Welcome to Ebony Storytelling. How are you doing today? We are going to be reading a story. And this is the last video of Twice The last Reed. unicorn. The la no, the last video. Oh. The last, the last video. Samurai. The last video of Twice Freed. Oh, okay. And I hope you guys really enjoy this video. For starters, we're going to be doing the Bible. And during the Bible time, me and my brother Daniel will be drawing some stuff. And then we will be showing you after Bible time. Then Kim will be doing the sh synopsis synopsis and then we are going to be doing twice free this is going to be our final video on twice free and we will move on after twice freed we're doing the mystery book mystery book mystery book but i hope you guys really enjoyed this video make sure to hit the like button subscribe and hit the bell to never miss another video i just learned that lmz is actually french well, let's go. Let's go. But I hope you guys really enjoy the video. Here's my dad. Here we go. Are you sure you're live streaming? Because I don't have a notification. And yes, it says it's live. Look it up on Facebook. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so we don't have a notification. I can't look it up on my phone because my phone is right here. Okay. All right. So, we are going to start with, as JJ said, the Bible. Yay, Granny Bear's there. Yay. Okay, so we're going to start with the Bible. We've got Psalm 40 and 41, and that's going to finish up book one of the Psalms. Are we good? Oh, dropped a pin. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so that is going to finish up book one of the Psalms. Um, if you haven't noticed um, in reading your Bible, Psalms is divided up into five separate books. And the first one is the longest with 41 chapters. So, <clears throat> with that uh, explained, I'm going to read from the English Standard Version of the Bible, Psalm 40. To the choir master, a Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie." You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch my life, snatch away my life. I was going to say snatch my life away, which I think means the same thing, but I do want to read it correctly. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those who let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. 
but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in your salvation. Sorry, rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Psalm 41. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Granny Bear. Hi, Mom. Okay. Psalm 41. To the choir master, a psalm of David. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up. Sorry, you do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, when will I, when will he die and his name perish? And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me, and raise me up, that I may repay them. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me, but you have upheld me because of my iniquity, and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. That's the end of book one of the book of Psalms. And tomorrow we will begin a book from the New Testament, which I will divulge when we begin our reading at that time. So I hope you're enjoying the reading of God's word. Here comes Kimberly with the synopsis, and she is just splendid. And we're really excited for Kimberly. All right. So y'all enjoy the synopsis and I'll be right back. So in the in the last few chapters, um, Onesimus he basically went over his time as a gladiator, and um, basically he'd made this um, he'd made a friend with this British guy, and um, he and the British guy they were. Um, they were fighting through the gladiator stuff, and then, um, and then they had to fight each other, and Onesimus, despite having a dagger, won, because his friend wanted him to win, and it turns out his friend actually was kind of a Christian, because he, he did believe in, um, in Jesus and everything, except... It's really weird. He had a master who was a Christian, and he's kind of like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what they're doing because that's that's cool. What were they threatening if, because they were kind of just play fighting at first? What were they threatening? They would have put wild beasts in there, and then they would have both died. So yeah. the guy was, was kind of feigning the fight and telling Onesimus, hey, you need to do this, right? Because this is what has to be done. And then afterwards, he almost threw himself in the river. Again. And, yeah, again. again. And then um, he passed out, and some. Why did he? Why somebody, did he stop? somebody um, called out to him or something, and then he passed out, and he was taken over to this place, and um, they healed him and everything a little. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> They healed him a little, yes. Who healed him? Um, it was, it was Luke, right? Luke. And what was, who was Luke? Um, Jesus' disciple? No, he wasn't. And he wasn't a Jedi either. <laughs> they did, they just said he was a Jedi, but no, he wasn't a Jedi. Who was Luke in the Bible? Matthew, Mark, Luke. Daniel, shh. He was close to God, I know, or Jesus. Okay. Was he Jesus? We'll cover that in a minute. Okay, go ahead. Was he Keep Jesus' going. brother? No. 
Just keep going. I know he did have a brother. Just keep going. Okay, so then after a bit, um, he found out that Paul was in Rome, and he's actually a prisoner, and um, and he's allowed visitors, so he's going over there now. All right. Okay. <clears throat> So, I'll explain really quickly who Luke was, and you know when I say really quickly, I really mean... Ten years! All so right, get ready. So, Luke was a physician, and he traveled around at least a little bit with Paul, um, and he ended up in Rome when Paul was in prison in Rome, and learned a lot of Paul's things, and Paul's uh, like sermons and stuff. And just like Mark... Um, did we read Mark recently? We did. We read Mark, right? Okay, just like Mark followed Peter around and learned all of Peter's sermons and recorded Peter's sermons and kind of filled in some spaces, probably with his own research or whatever, um, Luke actually recorded Paul's sermons um, in, the, in his Jesus narrative. So um, Luke is kind of the Paul gospel Mark is the Peter gospel, and then Matthew and John were their own apostles, um, so or disciples. So that you know, that's um, kind of how the gospels go. So there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, so um, before we get started with chapter 21, I just want to because I know there was a little bit of confusion yesterday. I was trying to give a little bit of a geography lesson, and so I printed up this map which should be visible on the live stream because I printed it mirror. But you can't see it if you're not looking at it. So anyway, we have Greece over here, and this is what we call Turkey, but um, in that day it was like Asia Minor or uh, Cappadocia or whatever. So um, Onesimus is from somewhere over here. I'm not exactly sure where Colossae is, but Onesimus is from somewhere over here, and he took the, he, Ephesus is right around here somewhere, and then he took the boat, and he went to Athens, and then from Athens, um, of course, he went to Corinth, and this is what I was saying. I thought it was north of Athens, but it's actually south of Athens, um, and it's this little, tiny, little passage of land that kind of goes in between the Aegean and this is the Adriatic Seas. And so um, there was a harbor on both sides and so they could actually <coughs> they could actually unload their goods, cross the cross this little um, it's like the opposite of a channel, whatever that is, um, this little isthmus or whatever, and then um, and then he, they could uh, put load into ships on the other side, and then they don't have to go around the um, this area down here, which was more treacherous waterways. And so that was a safer way to do um, trading. And so that made Corinth a very important city in the biblical world, in in the Roman world, um, because of the trading. So I thought that you guys would enjoy that, and I was able to print it mirror. And um, I thought that was kind of cool. So that's what that is. Of course, we all know Rome is over here somewhere on that big boot on the Tiber River. All right. So, <clears throat> oh, JJ has a picture. It's another Among Us picture. <laughs> Yay, because everybody knows Among Us except for Boy. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'll die without that reason. Okay, this is from Among Us. Triple Imposter. Lime sees... Well, black sees lime kill brown. Well, uh, green sees lime kill brown. Orange kills green. Black sees him get killed, blue kills black. All right. So, now we're going to read chapter 21. All right. 
Onesimus grew stronger rapidly, and after four or five days, he told Luke, his kindly physician, that he felt he should be moving on and not presume on Mistress Priscilla's hospitality any longer. His money was in safe deposit up at the barracks, and he would pay for his lodging and find other quarters. But first he had a favor to ask. Would Luke take him to visit Paul? Luke was surprised. He had sat daily with this unhappy boy and had spoken to him of Christ, but he had made no response. What is Chrissy into? Okay, sorry about that. He had made no response, only moved his head restlessly on the pillow as though reluctant to hear. He did not know that Onesimus was haunted day and night by a burden of guilt that had suddenly become intolerable, and yet, glimpsing the price he would have to pay to get rid of it, hardly dared face up to it. We will go tomorrow, said Luke. In the cool of the day, he is imprisoned near the Praetorian barracks. They set out together next evening, Onesimus feeble as an old man and leaning on Luke's arm. Aquila lived, lived in the Jewish quarter on the far side of the Tiber, so they crossed the river together and rested in one of the gardens on the bank. They went on slowly, and about sunset they reached the small house they had come to seek in the shadow of the barracks. He has many, many visitors, said Luke. You may have to wait before, you can, before he can give you an audience. He knocked at the door, and a voice bade him enter. "'Is it Luke?' said the tired voice of an old man within. "'I am glad you have come. We have a singular joy this evening. Who do you think has arrived to visit us all the way from Phrygia?' "'Phrygia!' Onesimus would have fled, but curiosity kept him rooted to the spot. Luke drew him gently in, and when his eyes became accustomed to the gloom, he saw a sight he would never forget.' A man, round-shouldered and small in stature, sat on a stool chained by his wrist to a burly Roman guard who lay full length on the floor, fast asleep. The prisoner was the same Paul he had seen in Ephesus, but infinitely older and frailer, and he peered at the newcomers with dim, scarred eyes, as though he had difficulty in recognizing, in recognizing them. Yet his face was alight with joy as he looked round on the little group of disciples who sat at his feet, and as he laid his hand in loving welcome on the head of the tall, travel-stained newcomer, "'Draw near and see for yourself, Luke. How often have you heard me speak of him, my brother in Christ, my beloved Epaphras from Asia?' The traveler turned to greet Luke, and as he did so, caught sight of the white-faced young man in the, with the frightened, haunted eyes in the doorway. They remained staring at each other in amazement for a few moments, and then Epaphras spoke. "'Can it be?' he said, puzzled. "'Were you not for many years in attendance on Philemon's crippled son? I heard you had perished in the Laodicean disaster. How comes it that I find you here?' His voice was stern, and still Onesimus stood silent, rooted to the spot. Fool, cried his reason, turn and run. There is yet time. Think of the penalties of the runaway slave. Think of those who, for the same crime here in this city, have been branded, crucified, thrown to the beasts. What are you waiting for? Those following feet have all but caught up with you now, said his heart. You are all but cornered and at bay. Now is your last chance to escape, but if you escape now, you escape forever. And do you really want to escape? So he stood his ground and answered humbly, Humbly, I am he. I escaped with my life and came to Rome. I have suffered many things, and the burden of my guilt has become intolerable, so that I no longer desire life. I have been sick and would rest now, but later on in the evening I pray that Master Paul will speak with me. In truth, his head was swimming, and the color had drained from his face, leaving it ashen gray. He put out his hand to steady himself, and Luke was beside him in an instant. The doctor spread his own cloak on the floor and laid his patient down beside the Roman soldier. Onesimus closed his eyes and knew that this was the end. He was covered and must turn... Sorry, he was cornered and must turn and face up to the stern demands of love and bow to a new man, sorry, a new eternal master. 
His brief, vain freedom was over, but what these demands would be, he was too tired and weak to think out. He lay very still and at peace and listened to the conversation of the little group. The first news he had received of his home for two years. They were speaking of the churches in Areopolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. All prospered, and Philemon and Aphia were well, strong in their love for Christ and for their brethren. Archippus had been sick and depressed, sometimes too tired to fulfill his ministry, yet battling on bravely, and now a joy had been given to him that he had never expected, for a tender attachment had grown up between him and a Christian maiden in Areopolis. Yet the little church was in danger, and Epaphras' voice was urgent and anxious as he spoke of the heresy that threatened it. There was that young Phrygian who was trying to combine the simplicity of the gospel of Christ with their own pagan beliefs. Christian slaves had been partaking in strange rites, keeping feasts, fasting till they were pale and weak, and trying to rise by mortification of the flesh and worship of angels to a gradual, painful knowledge of God. This heresy is not preached in Philemon's house, said Epaphras, but it has subverted many and even drawn some away who used to gather there. It flatters their intellects, and it is not far removed from their own beliefs in spirit worship and mysteries. As though Christ were not all in all, murmured the apostle, visibly agitated, I must write them a letter, begging them to beware, showing them again that in Christ dwells all the fullness of God. This is the only mystery they need ever explore. The Roman guard was relieved by a great fierce brute of a man who sat with his back to the wall, scowling and picking his teeth. Paul greeted him courteously, and the talk flowed on, but Onesimus lost the thread. By the light of a smoky lamp, he was watching the faces of the little company, urgent and troubled. There was a thin, dedicated-looking young man called Timothy, whose eyes blazed with love as he watched the apostle, and another older man called Epaphroditus, who seemed to be convalescing from a serious in illness. A third, with Jewish features, sat humbly in the background and said very little, probably a servant thought Onesimus sleepily, and wondered how long they would all go on talking. All night, he imagined, as another and another joined the group. A sharp-featured man called Demas came and interrupted their discussions with news of what was happening in Rome. But no one else seemed very interested, and he talked and the talk veered back to heresy in the churches, until a brother called Tychicus arrived. He had been preaching to a group of Christians in another district of Rome and seemed encouraged. We were a mixed company tonight, he said in a low voice, so as not to wake the soldier, who was snoring loudly. Slaves, Jews, a few of Caesar's household, two or three from the guard, high and low, Jew and Gentile, all one in Christ Jesus. But Aristobulus who sees Nero almost daily, thinks that the storm will soon break in good earnest and that it is no longer safe to gather in private homes. He thinks we should find a more secret... Demas kicked him, and he broke off and looked round. He had not seen the stranger lying, apparently asleep, under the cloak in the shadows of the room. Onesimus, opening an eye, saw him stoop and trace that mysterious sign on the floor and saw the others shake their heads. It was very late now. The company knelt round the dying lamp, and Paul prayed long and lovingly for the flock of God in Rome, in Greece, in Asia, for those threatened by ravening wolves in Colossae, for the burdened sinner sleeping on the floor. He blessed them as a father, and one by one they went off into the night, all except Timothy, who stayed and brought the old man food and drink, and would have settled him as comfortably as his chain would allow. Are you going to sleep, my father? I think not, my son. I would speak with that boy who came tonight, if he is not asleep. Bring him to sup with us. I am not asleep, said Onesimus. He felt rested and ready to talk. He joined Paul and Timothy at their humble meal, and then, down on the dark floor, with his face hidden, he told the apostle all, 
his hatred of Archippus, his revenge at Ephesus, the years of theft, the culminating robbery and flight at Laodicea, the killing of his friend in the arena, and his final terror of death. Once he started, he felt he could never stop, and that had been locked all that had been locked in his angry, resentful, unhappy heart came flowing out that night like a black flood. Weary, Timothy lay down and slept, but Paul and Onesimus talked on. Was there hope? Was there forgiveness? Would Christ yet have mercy in spite of the years of refusal and that determination to be free that had brought him so low? He asked these questions again and again, and Paul spoke to him so long and earnestly about the cross of Christ and all that it offered him. He can blot out that record of sin that is against you, said Paul. He can take it out of the way as long as though it were nailed to his cross. Justified by faith, you can have peace with God. I know, I have trodden this path. I saw Stephen the martyr die, and I consented and guarded the clothes of those who stoned him. I knew that torment of conscience, but I will tell you too how I saw Christ. It was almost morning when Paul finished that story. Onesimus listened, entranced. Truly how hard, how very hard it had been to kick against the pricks. The guard stirred in his sleep. Onesimus lifted his eyes and saw the dawn stealing in through the bars of that prison room and felt as though he would he had been born again a little child in a fair new world the burden had been lifted forever and in the joy of sin forgiven he had barely as yet given a thought to the next step enough for that moment that he had come to Christ and Christ had received him. Yet deep down in his broken, happy heart lurked the question that Paul had asked on the Damascus road. Soon he must ask it too and find out the answer. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And chapter 22. Um, I don't want to disrupt anybody, but could somebody hand me that? book that's on the table right there please what book? the big one the, 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 this one? The, no the big one that's bound in okay, leather this one this, one, Daniel. No, this no. one's the one that's the one that's that my foot touch <laughs> all right thank you okay i meant to bring that sorry chapter 22 Did Jessica get to join us tonight? I guess she, maybe she's busy. Maybe she's working or something. Chapter 22. He found a lodging with the Jew who had seemed like a servant, a man named John Mark. And he went daily to sit with the little company who surrounded Paul. He made himself useful too, running errands, patching up the house, drawing water with one with his one arm. For John Mark was busy with some writing, and Timothy, who suffered from indigestion, was not used to hard manual work. A timid, home-loving boy, Timothy's love for Paul had made him into a hero. He had followed him over land and sea, facing dangers and hardships, and now for two years he had shared the cheerless imprisonment. Onesimus grew to love Timothy, who never tired of telling him stories about the greatness and courage of his father in Christ. Paul was very busy just then. Epaphroditus had traveled from Philippi some time previously to bring Paul a gift from the church, and he had lingered on partly because he had become very ill, and partly because he could not bear to say goodbye. But summer was drawing to a close, and if he wished to get home while the seas were still navigable, he must leave very soon. Paul was busy composing and dictating a letter for him to take back to the Christians at Philippi. It was costing him much thought and exercise of mind. The church at Philippi was very dear to him, and every memory of their faithfulness and love was precious. But they were not perfect. Lately, according to Epaphroditus, two or three of the women had been getting very quarrelsome, and Lydia, who had opened her wealthy home to the Christians, seemed unable to keep them in order. It was a difficult letter to write, and day after day he had dictated a little and prayed much, and Onesimus often sat listening, wondering at the loving exhortations and the gentle rebuke and at the amazing new trains of thought that the letter kept starting in his mind. I trust in the Lord 
Jesus to send Timothy unto you shortly. Timothy, writing at Paul's dictation, looked up dismayed at the thought of going anywhere without his master, but Onesimus pricked up his ears. He loved Timothy, but Timothy acted as Paul's personal attendant. Epaphroditus would shortly be leaving for Philippi. Onesimus suddenly saw his own future stretching rosily before him. He would stay on in Timothy's place and look after Paul. He smiled as he suddenly remembered the years he had spent loathing his slavery, yearning to be free of it. Now that he was free, he longed to be a bond slave to this dis discrepant, scarred, this de decrepit, sorry, scarred old prisoner with the chain galling his wrist, and he suddenly realized what liberty really meant. Freedom to bow to the dictates of love and to give yourself to its voluntary slavery. Apart from the discipline of love, freedom was a dreary wilderness without compass or direction, a desert full of mirages, promising everything but yielding nothing. The more he thought about it, the better he liked the idea. He had collected his money at the barracks, and though it was not as much as he had expected, the procurer had been in a towering passion at their feeble performance and obvious disinclination to kill each other. He had been able to pay his debts, secure his lodgings with Don, John Mark, and he still had enough left to live on for some months. He had tried to buy some small luxuries for Paul, but the old man would not accept them. "'Keep your money, my son,' he had said gently. Put it in safe deposit. I think one day soon you will need it. What had he meant by that, wondered Onesimus. Was, was Paul a fortune teller? No. He just knew. No, Paul wasn't a fortune teller. Okay. Um, keep your... I'm going to start that over again. Keep your money, my son, he had said gently. Put it in safe deposit. I think one day soon you will need it. What he had meant by that, wondered Onesimus, for he had a feeling that there was some hidden meaning in that apparently artless remark. But there was no opportunity to question Paul these days. There were always visitors waiting, and the old apostle was absorbed in the departure of Epaphroditus and his letter to the Philippians. The seas were only considered perfectly safe till the middle of September, and Paul, well taught by his own experience of risking a journey too late in the year, was determined he should be gone by then. So he worked on, sometimes far into the night, his mind and heart more in Philippi than in Rome, till one day he reached the triumphant conclusion, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to abound, to be full and to be hungry. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I have all and abound, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Even the guard who knew a smattering of Greek leaned forward and stared. Was this fellow a lunatic who had illusions, sitting here chained, Huddled in an old patched cloak with the threat of death hanging over his head, what on earth had he got to be content about? Onesimus, too, marveled. Was it possible to accept any circumstances with joy if Christ were there? It seemed so. What a difference this would have made to his slavery, had he but known. It was a sad day when Epaphroditus finally left. He did not know if he would ever see his dear, dear father in the faith ever again on earth. But to meet in the presence of Christ would be far better, and his eyes were bright with hope through his tears. Onesimus and the rest of the company went with him out along the Appian Way, for he was aiming for the, the port of Brundisium. They walked a long time in the bright September sunshine, with the vineyards a glory of gold on either side of them. At the top of a little hill near the Jewish burial ground, they finally committed Epaphroditus to God and said goodbye. There was almost a feeling of relief as they met again by the lamplight that night. Soon the winter would come sweeping down from the Alps, and there could be no more serious partings until the spring. Paul looked tenderly round on the little group. I must write letters to the believers in the Lycus Valley this winter, he said. God will give me the words I need. 
Tychicus, when the winter is over, you shall set out to visit the churches in Asia. It may even be that I shall accompany you. Surely my trial cannot be delayed much longer now. The days sped by in work and learning, but there was unrest in the air, the wickedness of the emperor's new favorite Tigillinus, and Nero's terror of any rival loyalty to himself were making the positions of the Christians in their royal household almost impossible. Virtue itself was suspect, and to worship Christ was considered treachery. A meeting was held one night, and elders of different groups in Rome crowded into Paul's room with t tense, anxious faces. The houses are watched, and we no longer dare sing our hymns, they insisted. Arrests may be made any day, and there will be neither mercy nor justice at the trial of a Christian. We must find some secret place of meeting outside the city. Some have suggested those old subterranean Jewish burial places out on the Appian Way. If some of us could go by night and continue these excavations, then in any time of danger we could gather there in safety. None would hear us down there in the dungeons of the earth. The company nodded. It seemed a wise plan, and Onismus rejoiced. He was longing to use his muscles, and here was a chance to put his tremendous strength at the service of the church as soon as his arm was healed. He was eager to start, and he talked to John Mark about it when they reached their lo lodging late that night. John Mark smiled. It would be an excellent thing for you, Onesimus, he said. And would you work off some of your spare energy? And would work off some of your spare energy. But I shall not join you. I have to finish my task. What is your task, John Mark? asked Onesimus timidly. John Mark was shy, a shy, humble man, who talked little about his own affairs. He was usually hidden away in a corner writing. But when he wrote, his dark eyes glowed, and he seemed to be transformed into a different being. Now he hesitated. Have you ever wondered how I, a Jew from Jerusalem, came to be here with Paul in Rome? he asked abruptly. I supposed, replied Onesimus, that you came with him in his travels. Has he not been in Jerusalem many times? John Mark shook his head. I will tell you my story, he said, bringing the words out with difficulty, because in some ways it started like yours. I was more than thirty, it was more than thirty years ago when I was just a boy. My mother had a big, spacious house in Jerusalem near the palace of the high priest, and she often ministered to Jesus Christ. I loved him, too, but I was very young. It was the Passover night, and we all knew something terrible was going to happen. We had been keeping the feast, and it was late before we went to bed. Then we heard a great noise in the night, an armed rabble passing under the window, and I looked out and saw him, pushed along captive in the midst, and his disciples following some way behind. I thought this was the chance of my life to stand with him, or rather with him. I had always longed to be one of his disciples. I wrapped a cloth round me and rushed out into the night to catch them up. But just before I arrived, he had said something that had angered everybody. I think he asked them, quite calmly, why they had never arrested him before. The disciples, seeing the mob getting threatened, all turned and ran. There was a long silence. Onesimus reclined on his couch. Mark sat with his head on a, in his hand, struggling to go on. I ran, too. I was suddenly terrified. They seized, so, seized hold of the cloth I had wrapped round me, but I shook free and left it in their hands. If you all remember, there's, there is that verse in the book of Mark where um, there was a boy that was left naked in the street. There's the story right there. Later, I tried to peep into the courtyard of the palace, and to my relief, I saw Peter in there. It was nearly morning then, and I remember hearing a cock crow, but as he approached, Peter suddenly threw back his head and cursed and swore and said he had never known Jesus before, and that broke whatever I had left. I went home and did not dare leave the house for three days. John was the only disciple who was with him when he died. I felt life was over for me. I lived on in Jerusalem and worked as a scribe and saw a lot of the apostles 
especially Peter. He told me a great deal about the years he had spent with the master, and I felt sadder than ever that I had missed my chance. I became very friendly with my cousin Barnabas. Thirteen years after that night, he took me up to Antioch with him, and there I had my second chance. Onesimus looked up eagerly. No, it is nothing to be glad about. I failed again. I had not got in... I had not got it in me to succeed. Barnabas and Paul were sent out by the church to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. I went with them, pleased and proud to have the chance to serve Christ once more and to make good. But I was frightened out of those Jews. I was frightened of those Jews and of that awful sorcerer in Cyprus. And when we crossed to Perga, I was seasick all the way. I was in... I was a town boy and those wild snow-tipped heights that rise up from the coast terrified me paul was going to plunge straight into their vastnesses north to lystra i felt sure we should be attacked by brigands or eaten by wolves my nerves gave way completely and i turned and went home there was another long silence the moonlight suddenly flooded the little room and rested on mark's head like a benediction by the time I reached Jerusalem, I regretted it bitterly. I thought my heart would break. When they returned two years later, wounded and scarred with stoning, I dared to ask for another chance, but Paul would not hear of it. I was a deserter, a failure, and there was no room for such in Christ's army. Barnabas thought he was hard and unjust, and he, just, he took me back to Cyprus and was very good to me. But I think Paul was right. Christ himself said that those who put their hand to the plow and then look back are not fit for the kingdom of God. And then, queried Onesimus, it was something that Peter told me that gave me hope. I had always wondered how he could preach after he had denied Jesus like that. And when I was feeling particularly hopeless one night, I asked him about it. He told me that after he had denied Jesus, he turned and saw his master gazing at him, and that broke his heart. He gave up everything and went back to his fishing, feeling that life with Christ was finished. But one morning his risen master came down to the beach very early and lit a fire just as they were coming in with their nets. And just as Peter had denied him three times by that fire in the dark, so the Lord sat by that other fire at dawn and gave him the chance to take back all he had said. Three times he made Peter say that he loved him, as though his love could wipe out all his lies. But he had to go back to the point where he had failed and unsay it. What's so funny? Mm -hmm. Why don't you put that down for now? There is not much more, said Mark, but I thought perhaps I could do the same. I had left Paul when he was in danger and needed me, and when I heard he was in prison, awaiting trial and possibly death, I decided to come home, to come to him and to stand by him to the end, if need be. He was very kind and received me and forgave the past. There is not much to do here except to wait, so I am trying to write down all that Peter told me about those three years. It seems right to me that I, the servant who failed and turned back, should tell the story of God's servant who never turned back. Sometimes when I write about him, I feel that I am one with him, carried forward to my goal. I feel that he will somehow finish all that I have failed in him, and that in him I may yet accomplish some good thing. Onesimus had risen from his elbow. John Mark, he asked hoarsely, why do you tell me all this? Because, said John Mark steadily, I do not think there is any progress unless we go back to the place where we failed and seek to put it right. He lay down to sleep, but Onesimus tossed and turned on his bed to go back where he had failed and put it right, back to slavery, back to disgrace and punishment. Was it all to end in this? And not only slavery, one night sitting in the dark so that no one should see his flaming cheeks, he had dared to ask Master Epaphras whether he had heard any news of the little orphaned Mistress Irene, and Epaphras had answered with tender amusement. She had refused all proposals of marriage from rich suitors, and was still single and free. Despite her gentle birth and high position, 
she had insisted on staying on with her father's shepherd and his wife, who taught her of Christ and brought her into the church at Laodicea. She lived as a shepherdess and had spent much of her inheritance on children who, like herself, were left homeless and orphaned in the earthquake. As a Christian and a free man, Onesimus might go back and claim her. As a slave, never. Christ was a hard master, and yet Paul and Mark and Timothy had never sought to be free of his service. To go forward was anguish, to turn back, unthinkable. He buried his face in the pillow, and Paul's question was wrung from his aching heart. Lord, what wilt thou have me do? Chapter 23 It was a bright May morning some months later when two travelers passed beneath the walls of Laodicea and left the town behind them. They walked slowly, Tychicus, because he was getting on in years and was coming to the end of a long journey, and Onesimus because his heart was heavy as lead. It seemed years since that morning when they had said goodbye to Paul, still in chains, his trial apparently forgotten by the irresponsible knave who called himself emperor. Paul was hopeful, sure that he would soon be set at liberty and come to them, but Onesimus could feel no such hope, and when the day of parting came, he felt his heart would break. All the beauty of the Italian spring, with its foaming fruit blossom and field of asphodel and narcissi and iris, had failed to cheer him, and the long sea journey with its idle hours had been torture to him. They had stayed for a week or so in Ephesus, and the Christians, pressing on in spite of the riots and persecutions, had greeted them joyfully and had gathered night after night to hear, the, hear and discuss the letter Paul had written to them. It was a long circular letter which was to be read again in Areopolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. And the words of that letter had steadied Onesimus and brought some measure of light and comfort. Now that he had irrevocably renounced his earthly love, it was good to be reminded of the love of Christ that passeth knowledge, and in battling against his fear and rebellion, it was comforting to hear of the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. And now, although his heart ached and his lips felt dry with fear, he was conscious of a strange peace. He had obeyed, and the results of his obedience he could leave with his master. I think we shall be there soon after noon, said Tychicus, glancing at the steep little road that led up into the hills from the right of the highway. I shall be glad to rest for a while in Colossae. It has been a long journey." You will read them the letters tonight, Master Tychicus, said Onesimus, slowing his pace, for the older man seemed weary. I think the Christians will gather tonight to read Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. I pray that they may take it to heart. The Ephesian letter can wait, for it is more general in character and addressed to all. The third one is merely personal and deals with a private matter. The third one? queried Onesimus, surprised. I did not know you carried three letters. Yes, a personal one, from Paul to Philemon. It is not to be read in the church. It deals with some matter that concerns him alone. They climbed on in silence for a time. Soon they would reach the lower plain, and then Onesimus would look up and see the outskirts of Colossae, and the canyons and the meadows, bright with marigolds and daisies, where Philemon's sheep grazed. Already he could hear the crying of the half-grown lambs, the bleeding of the dams, and the rushing of the stream, where he had loved to play as a little boy. How he had sometimes longed for these sights and sounds in Rome. Now they only filled him with dread and foreboding. Christ, he whispered, give me courage, and let not my punishment be more than I can bear. And once again some words from the Ephesian letter came back to him and sang themselves to the steady rhythm of their footsteps all the way up the hill, able to do, able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think. They were climbing the second hill, taking the path that, pa that bypassed the town and led up to the farm at the foot of the canyons. In the shade of a tall poplar tree, Onesimus stopped. Master Tychicus, he said, you go on alone. 
I will wait here under the tree. Tell Master Philemon that I have come, repentant, forgiven by Christ, to return to my slavery and to hear what punishment he thinks me to inflict. He thinks meet to inflict. If he will receive me, beg him of his mercy to speak to me here alone. Tychicus hesitated, and Onesimus read his thoughts. I will not run away, Master Tychicus, he said. Have I followed Christ thus far to turn back now? My master will certainly find me waiting here. Very well, my son, replied Tychicus, and he went on alone. Onesimus watched him disappear into the homestead, and then, burying his head in his hands, he sat and waited. He wondered whether Philemon would, would deign to come himself. It was unlikely. He would probably send a couple of slaves to chain and lead him, at, lead him in as befitted a runaway thief. Well, whatever was coming, he was ready for it, because Christ would stand beside him. Once again, he was conscious of that unreasonable sense of peace. Footsteps were approaching. Not the hurried footsteps of slaves, but the slow, halting footsteps he knew so well. He could not look up, for this was going to be the worst ordeal of all. Onesimus! Archippus' hand was on his shoulder. You've come back! Glaucus told us you were dead, and how I have mourned for you! I heard Tychicus telling my father, I think he will come soon, but I could not wait. I slipped out while they were talking. Oh, Onesimus, how glad I am to see you. You won't be when you know the truth, blurted out Onesimus, and I might as well tell you right away, Archippus. It was all because of me you became a cripple. I hated you, and I whispered to the crowd that your father had burnt the books. I did not mean you to be really hurt, just a black eye, but I started it. You would be walking straight and strong today if it had not been for me. There was a stunned silence. It took Archippus some moments to digest this news. Then he gave a shaky little laugh. You had reason to hate me, Onesimus. I wronged you and humiliated you not just that once, but every day. If I had not become a cripple, I should still be walking in arrogance and sin. I sometimes think I am like Jacob at the ford of Jabbok. I had to halt upon my thigh before I could know his name. I am still glad you have come home. They were silent again, Archippus, because he had no more to say, and Onesimus, because he was overwhelmed with love and gratitude and relief. Then Archippus suddenly whispered, My father! He was coming down the hill slowly, tall and dignified, as ever with a parchment in his hand. Onesimus rose to meet him, and then bowed himself to the ground. Rise, said Philemon. We counted you as dead and mourned for you. I presume you took the money and fled to Rome. Tell me, why have you returned? To confess and atone for my sin, which is greater than you know, to restore what I can of your gold, and to put myself once again into your hands as your slave and your property to do with what you will to me. That is good, said Philemon, but you have not really answered my question. Why did you come back? Because Christ bade me come. At first I resisted his voice, but I found no rest, so I came. You did well. Be seated, and you too, my son Archippus. I have a letter from our dear father in Christ, Paul. Let us read it together. It was very quiet on the hillside. Even the lambs seemed to have stopped their bleeding as the gracious words that have survived the centuries fell for the first time on the amazed ears of the guilty slave. And at this time, they have the condensed version in this book, but I want to read the full version because it's only one chapter and it's really... it. I, I don't know why they didn't just include the whole thing unless there was a copyright issue. Probably. Maybe so. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm looking for it. It's really tiny. It's right after... I almost read it when we read... Um, when we read the uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, but I knew that it fit with this book so well. I'm telling you... <laughs> telling you this is the tiniest book all right so 
Here it is. The letter of Paul to Philemon, or more commonly called Philemon, but I've called him Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and the faith that you have toward the, that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been, have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might be might not be by compulsion, but out that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of you owing, of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That is the book of Philemon. And now I lost my place in this book, but I easily found it. So here we are. I'm going to just quickly finish. There's like one page left. Uh, Jessica passed on to say that she was at work still. Uh, That's okay. We, we appreciate you anyway. We appreciate you. Okay. Above all that you ask or think, those were the words that sang in his ears as he bounded down the hill three days later, long before sunrise. The first bird seemed to be shouting hallelujah and the stream to be bubbling its praise for its creator. Ye, sh ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. The words had been written centuries before, but had anyone ever gone forth on a yet dark summer morning with such joy as this? The miles swept past. He was walking in at the gates of Laodicea, marveling at the work they had accomplished in the past three years. Fair buildings were beginning to rise from orderly streets where ruins and heaps of rubble had lain. It was said that Rome had sent an offer of help to the afflicted town, but the citizens of Laodicea were entirely self-sufficient. We are rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, they had replied proudly. He had reached the Heriopolis gate, now restored, and there he stopped, suddenly transfixed. She was coming up the slope toward the city, walking slowly, because three or four little children were clinging to her hands and her skirts. 
The sun had swung clear of the eastern heights, and its first light fell on her bent head, and the flowers were opening their faces as though to look up at her. The silver dew still lay thick on the grass. It might have been the first morning in Eden, though the boy thought the boy in the gateway. There is a man waiting for you, said one of the children. She looked up quickly. Apart from the flush of her cheeks and the brightening of her eyes, she showed no surprise. After all, in a sense, he had been there all the time. She quickened her pace and came straight to him, and the little children ran to keep up with her, leaving tiny footprints in the dew. Grace and peace be with you, Mistress Irene, he said gently. I have kept my word and come back to you, a free man and a follower of Christ. She looked up at him, and her face was as radiant as the morning. I knew you would come, she said, and gathering the children about them, they turned their backs on the town and set out hand in hand toward the sunrise and the hills of Areopolis. The end. So, who likes the story? If you like it, give it a thumbs up. I give it a heart. Give it hearts. Um, I I like the story. I like how I. I don't know if I've ever read a story that parallels the Bible so well. Um, Yours will. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to to share it's this story. Lovely. It really is one of my favorites, um, even though it's kind of a simple. It's like a maybe a junior high story, but um, it it is um, really really good. So. Um, that's all I've got for tonight. Does anybody else have anything? I know we usually have the parade of pictures now. So. There's a cat. Oh, wait. I don't want to show you mine. Oh, Daniel's, Daniel's going to show us a picture. We have a cat down here. Okay. Cat we have a cat down there. Yay. Here's Daniel's picture. Look who's the kitty. Okay. All right, so without further ado, I hope that you have a. Says cool Rebecca says, "Cool picture, Daniel." Yeah. I hope everybody has a super evening, and I don't know if we're gonna read tomorrow night or not, but we do definitely have headquarters. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, is that Daniel's picture? Okay. Um, no. I hope you have a super evening. I don't know if we're gonna read tomorrow, but we do have another book planned. Um, mom says Daniel equals happy dance. Um, I don't know what that means, but <laughs> okay. Oh, so, <laughs> happy dance. Okay. So, all right. So, all right. I, um, okay. So like I was trying to say, sorry, I keep getting distracted now. I don't know for sure a hundred percent if we're reading tomorrow or not. Um, however, uh, we do have another book that we've already picked out um, to be reading, and I think that you will enjoy it. And um, March 26th, save the date, is our one-year anniversary, and we've got a very special book that we're going to be starting on March 26th. So um, that's still a month away, so we've got some time. Oh, and by the way, um, I was wrong. Um, this is the shortest playlist that we've done but uh, we like every single book in the Narnia series was less um, less videos. Um, the longest one was eight videos. The shortest one was six. So every single one of the Narnia stories was was shorter than this one. So not the shortest story that we did, just the shortest playlist. All right, I think R Kimberly R Kimberly has something here. So apparently I'm R Kimberly now. R Kimberly. But I yeah, am, yeah, um, I'm, I'm wearing, I'm wearing my Sailor Moon shirt. I'm not sure if you can see it, but I got bored, so I sketched it. Oh. All right. Good night, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow or next time. Bye. <laughs>